to the podcast where we bring on remarkable people to tell their stories. I'm Paul Gilman. I'm Daniel Lance. And this is Pod So One. Over his 33-year Army National Guard career, Command Sergeant Major Carl Holcomb rose to become the State Command Sergeant Major, the highest-ranking enlisted officer in the Virginia National Guard. He is the first black man to hold the position. He also spent 17 years as a correctional officer and, as you'll hear, had to de-escalate sometimes life-threatening situations both for himself and the inmates. In this conversation, Carl tells us stories from both careers, and we end with his thoughts on the current social climate. So here's Carl Holcomb. We're uh, joined by uh, an old Army buddy of mine back in the day. We, I mean, I think we met when you were a staff sergeant. Yes, I was pro- I was, probably a, a, was I a lieutenant or a captain? He was a captain. I was a I captain. You. And right. I, I probably had learned a couple things, but I still had a lot to learn back <laughs> when we met. Anyway, Command Sergeant Major Carl Holcomb is with us. I'm very excited to talk to you tonight. Yes, sir. Uh, to Welcome. Hear, to hear your story. And uh, it goes back, I guess, to the... Uh, mid mid to late nineties. Yes, sir. It does. Of course, you, you were probably a very young man back then, but we're not young men anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the mind's willing, but the body tells you different. <laughs> right. right. And my, my my dad was telling me a story about how uh, he's gotten so old that when he sees stuff that he knows he needs to pick up off the floor, okay. it's still a decision. <laughs> <laughs> There's a good right. chance he's just going to let it be. <laughs> not, not I pick understand it up. that. I understand that. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, but um, uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, we right. had breakfast the other day. You got a chance to meet Daniel, so uh, I think we're ready to go. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I know you now as Sergeant Major, and I will call you by nothing else. <laughs> oh, wow. And Sergeant Major uh, Holcomb probably will refer to me as sir the entire time. I don't think I've right. ever heard him call me Paul, which means he is just slightly more professional than Command Sergeant Major Mike Stockhouse. Because <laughs> Mike kept going back and forth between yeah. Paul and Sir. <laughs> it's all good. A little bit more disciplined. So, uh, Sergeant Major, you are from southern part of the state. Right, south side of Virginia, basically. A um, little town in no, no, Charlotte, Courthouse, Charlotte County. Um, it's a rural community, rural county. Um, it's kind of funny, though, because the town itself... If you blink your eyes, you go through it. It wouldn't even know you were in there. It's that mm. small, but if you look at the county itself, it it's pretty big. It um, touches Mecklenburg, um, Pennsylvania County. I mean, it's spread pretty much in South Side Virginia. It's a pretty large county. But the town itself is like a one light it's kind like of a, like a teardrop. It, mm. Right. When you grew up, there was no stoplight, no nothing like that, right? Still isn't. I mean, it, oh, it's a it's a no stoplight town. No stoplight. You can drive from one end of it to the other, and you won't see a stoplight nowhere. What's the most uh, notable landmark? Probably the courthouse. You would recognize that they just built a, a multi million dollar one. It, in, I mean, oh. it's it's huge, um, but the old courthouse. It dates back. It's like a historical landmark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I bet. Uh, why, how, is, how big is uh, Charlotte Courthouse in terms of population? Are we talking about a few hundred people? Base, yes, yes. So back then and now? And now. It's, wow. It, nothing's really changed. It's rural, a lot of farming. It, that's it. Um, tobacco, corn, um, farms, cattle, you know, that was basically the, the staple um, for that community when I was growing up. And the only thing that he had other than that was a textile mill that was in Keysville, Virginia, which is about nine miles from the Charlotte Courthouse uh, that, that did textile. Hmm. Um, Virginia was a Virginia craft, it was called. Okay. The mill was it. But then that went out of business, um, I guess, a little bit after I went into, into college right hmm. after school. What did your parents do when you were a kid? My wife, she, my, my mother was a housewife, and she did... Um, Various jobs for for other people, you know, keeping up their house and everything. And my dad, he was basically um, a laborer, but he also drove school bus for the county. And he drove that for I don't know how many years. I mean, you know, so those those was his jobs and hers. He was grinding and she was grinding. Mm. That's pretty much. Making ends meet. Right. And and how many siblings do you have? 
four. Four besides of me. And which one are you out of the mix? I'm the third. You're right in the middle. Yes. I you're am. the middle of the middle. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> you're, sur- you're surrounded by, by both sides Got a, times two. I have an older brother and an older sister. And then I'm the third into my baby brother, Ryan. He's under me. And he was he was a surprise. I think nobody really did. <laughs> But I was glad that he came if he, along. If he listens to this, is he going to know his, it was he was a surprise? <laughs> yeah, he already does. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, the amazing part about it is, you know, I was glad that he did come along, even though he was a surprise because I got so tired of being called a baby of the family, mm. right? So now he has that distinction. I moved out of that slot. Is he close to, in age to you? We're about seven, eight years apart. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm, He's def- definitely the baby. Yes, he is. <laughs> I yeah. love it. So uh, how did you sp- – Daniel loves this question. I ask this question. Everybody I know I ask this question to because it matters right. to me. Daniel's tired of it. But Own it, I, baby. But, but Carl, you, you and I don't have to care. Right. Uh, when you were 10, 11, 12 years old, how did you spend your time? When you had free time, what were you doing? I really didn't have much free time because when I came – when I got out of school, I already had a set – Thing of chores I had to get that done, uh. and then there's homework in the bed, and in the weekends, you know, you were out there, you know, cutting grass, helping my grandfather. He would, um, he worked, um, basically, um, cutting grass at um, cemeteries and stuff. Right. Um, there was a church in in um, Keysville and Steel there um, that he cut grass for. So my time was spent with that, you know. In, so you were just working seven days a week, pretty much. Yes, mm. sir. yes, I was. Man, wow! Because you needed to, right, right. And like I say, if if I did have some downtime, it was other kids in the neighborhood surrounding us that you know we would get together and we do the baseball thing with the dirt fields and all like that. We play you know baseball and and throw a football or whatever like that to run some of the energy off. But other than that, we were we were working most of the time. And you were working for money, or you were working because that's what your parents told you you were doing. My first check was with my grandfather. I helped him at the cemetery, okay. and I would get like a monthly staple from him. You know, he would keep the time that we worked and everything, so I would get get money from that. But otherwise, you know, it was just I had chores, and that was it. I did it. Were you uh, more of a jock in high school? Were you more of a uh, academic kid? I was. It was pretty much an even split. Um, I was pretty smart in in school. Um, in fact, I finished school a year earlier than what I... What? Mm-hmm. I graduated from high school in, um, a year early. And as far as the sports and all, yeah, I was football. I ran track a little bit. Um, didn't mess with baseball that much, but football, track, and basketball were my three sports. What position did you play in football? I was a linebacker, middle linebacker. I, w- I wouldn't want to mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was a, I was a middle linebacker, middle in the guard. That was my that's my position. So when you were playing middle linebacker, were you just trying to take the other guy's head off? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I was. I was. Uh, it's hard to picture because uh, you're such a nice guy. He's a very nice guy, yeah. but uh, you put a helmet on and you're, you're 16, yeah. 17 years old. Yeah, and uh, it, it's it's a funny story um, when I, I was in, I was playing football. And I got a full full um, scholarship to Ferrum University. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. You were a baller. Yeah, I was. I was. You and I have never talked about this. No, we haven't. Oh, what, wow. What okay. university was it? What's that? Ferrum. Ferrum. F-E-R-R-U-M. Okay. I, had a, I had a full, full ride scholarship. In my senior year, homecoming game, as luck would have it, we were playing against my wife's, my current wife's team, Appomattox. Mm. And um, they were like the number one team in the district. And we was just, I mean, we was the lower to low. I mean, we was, people just ran over us like. Nobody expected much out of you. No, but for some reason that night, we were on. I mean, I guess it was just, we were just motivated because we said, well, we're going to beat this number one team. And. They pride themselves on nobody had ever tackled their quarterback or got to their quarterback. But that night, I was all over him. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And it's hard to get to the quarterback from the middle linebacker spot. It, it is. You got but, a lot of people to go through. But it, it was funny that the center, 
because I would line right up over top of him. And you had those arm guards. Oh, yeah. And so what he would do, I would, I would look at it, and the first time we come off the ball, I come up with, with my arm. Because right? that was legal back in the day. Not, it, not anymore. You can't no, do that anymore. Right, right. And, and so after that, he would he was anticipating <laughs> me hitting him. He would shut his eyes, right? <laughs> and I just threw him out the way, and I'd get to the quarterback. So I did that about four straight times. Oh, man. And the quarterback got up, and he, I mean, he was mad. He was angry. So the, the coach called timeout, and they went over the sideline. And got, they sent the play in especially for me. <laughs> and that's how my knee got screwed up. Mm, yeah. You're right. Yeah, because you've had a problem Wait, with that they, knee for a long right. time. Yeah. They targeted you? They did. They did. To oh, get, to I, I get, played in games where guys were targeted. To get yeah. me out of the game, and they did. So they injured you to get you out of the game, and, and that hurt your knee. Right, and it also stopped my scholarship to Ferrum. That's ridiculous. Right. Over high school football. That's right. Crazy. It is. Yep. I, I mean, how many high school football games are played every Friday night in this country? Exactly. Uh, I mean, thousands. Mm. And, and that stuff's going on in games, right? And it, it, it was going on back when you were playing. It was going on when I was playing, right. and uh, I, it still baffles my mind that there are adult men, ages mm-hmm. twenty five to the sixty five, yeah, right. that are saying, "Hey, you teenager, go go mess up that other teenager. Let's, let's stop that kid from going to college, right? Yeah. So yeah. we can win this game, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. What, what does it look like when they make a play that targets somebody? Do they just?" Is it a defensive play, an offensive play? It could be anything, but what they did with me, they, it was a, it was, um, it was an in and around sweep, okay. And the, and the, and the back came around, the fullback come around, and I saw him when he came around. And so what I did, I was sliding down in line because what is all was also illegal. Then what they call about the you grab the person in oh, the yeah, back, horse collar, horse collar, yeah. That was legal back there too. So you could do that. You could do that. So when he came around the corner, what they would do, they would have the guards on offense, what they call trap. And as I was sliding down the offensive line, and, and you know, they basically it was like a free play. They let me go, and, and you I, knew something. That and was and so I, I thought about it, but it was too late. When I thought about it, I said, "This is too easy." And just as I reached. To grab the guy coming around the end, I looked in the corner of my eye and I saw the two guards and one of them, he was airborne and drove his helmet into yep. the side of my leg. Oh. And it went click. And so I, I, I fell on the ground and I got back up and I fell back down. And then I, it felt like somebody took a hot iron mm. and stuck it through my leg. And then I looked down and my kneecap was like sitting on the inside. That's what he did. The, the crown of the helmet was intended to take your kneecap and move it to the side. So of that, the right. coach on that team was like, hey, take your helmet, do a Superman dive, and try to hit his knee. Exactly. That's oh. what they did. And that took me out of the game. That's terrible. All right. And so that was the end of your football. It was. Playing. It was. Man. Right. You're still a little mad about it, aren't you? <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> you should be. You're right. You should be. Right. That's crazy. Because, mm. I, you know. I think about you know where before where I could have been. We it, may not be sitting here. Exactly. You might be doing uh, famous podcasts. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Well, <laughs> thankfully, it sounds like you still had a pretty active career uh, with the military, despite despite right. your knee injury. Um, but but when did uh, Virginia State University get onto your radar? Um, right after um, high school, I attended um, a community college, um, John Edwards Community College okay. in Keysville yep. for two years. Got my um, associate's degree there mm-hmm. and um so once i got that i said well i'm going to try to continue my education so that when i saw I had buddies of mine who went with me to um keysville to john daniel community college they actually got me interested into virginia state because their family had gone in so that's how i got involved with that so I, once I left the community college, I went straight into Virginia State, but I only like did two years at Virginia State. At the time, I got my bachelor's degree because a lot of my credits transferred over. So I did two years there. Um, cool. And w- once that happened, um, then I was basically looking for something to do as far as work because, like I said, I, I've always been a person who, who wanted to do more. And I said, tech being a 
working on a textile mill because my my basic jobs you're talking about my my history of work I was working at a sawmill that my father's cousin owned from like 7.30 in the morning till like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I would leave there, go home, shower, and then go to work at this textile mill okay. from, from like about 5 o'clock till 12 midnight, go home, sleep, and get up get and do, back, it, all and over do it all over again. And that got old very quick. Oh, I bet. Right, right. But so, How old were you when you were doing that? Um, I had just come out of high school. Um, okay, yeah. So this was between high school, high school college. and college. Yes, that's a that's a lot a lot of work yeah. every day, man. Right. But I was motivated because I wanted to get a get a car. And my father, you know, he said, "Well," and he always distilled to send me. He said, "You know, well, I'm not gonna get you no car. If you want one, you're gonna work for Same it." Same conversation my dad had with me. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so, in the same thing, you know, I'm I'm outdoors, but I love hunting. And the same thing, my first gun, I I was looking for to get it at Christmas. <laughs> you, and, your dad had different ideas. Yeah, oh yes, <laughs> and I come downstairs that morning, and I looked under the tree, and I was so disappointed. And so, after about an hour or so, he came and said, "You're looking for that that shotgun, weren't you?" And I said, "Yes, sir." He said, well, I could have got it for you. He said, but I'm, I didn't want to do that. He said, what you're going to do, you're going to go to work with your grandfather, cutting grass the summer at the cemetery. You're going to save your money up and say at the end of the summer, what you don't have saved up, I will put with it and we'll go and get you the shotgun. Sounds like a good deal. And he did. And I still had a shotgun a day. Nice. And it looks like it just came off the shelf. And, and, it, and the point of that is clearly... You had to earn it, and and because you earned it, you ha- took care of it. Like and that's exactly yeah. his exact words to me. He said, "He said if I had given you this, he said you wouldn't have thought nothing of it. He said you wouldn't have took care of it. He said, but you worked for this and you made your, made it happen with your own money. So yeah, and you would if you hadn't earned it, you wouldn't have that shotgun. No, nope. yeah, yeah, you no, wouldn't would. know where it is today. Yeah, exactly. But he also he also didn't leave you hanging. If you hadn't saved up enough. He still came through exactly. after you'd put the work in and said, "Okay, right, right, I'll I'll pay whatever's left." Right. So that's that's good uh, parenting, I'd say. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, he ended up producing a, a, a strong uh, contributing citizen. Mm-hmm. Here. Yeah, I think that's a pretty fair statement. Were you the first? Was your generation the first to go to college, or were you the first in your generation to go? My sister, she went to community college ahead of me, um, but I was the first to graduate to community college. And go further. Right. So I've got got my master's degree too. So, yes, you do. Right. And that that happened when I got in the guard, though. That they helped me get that. Oh yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. army and the guard in particular has right. uh, has money for educational right. stuff. I, I I talked about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, I know you probably talked a lot more about it than I have. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was definitely the, a way to retain people. It sure. was. Yeah. Was the master's also at Virginia State? No, that was at Avid University. Okay. Mm-hmm. I feel like we were talking about Averett just not long ago. Mm-hmm. Was it because that's where you got your master's? Or yeah, that's, a, I don't know. You, you mean, did we talk about it at breakfast? Did we talk about it like separately? I don't. Yeah. I, sorry. I don't know. Dan, yeah. Daniel's tired. He, he just, <laughs> he's been doing a lot of driving back and forth to Tennessee. Uh, and, he, and his girlfriend, unfortunately, her, uh, her great, great, great aunt passed away. Uh, so he's driving back to Tennessee uh, wow. tomorrow. Yeah, her dad is from Chattanooga. I um, see. And his, Mer- his whole family's out there. Wow. Yeah, he, he's a Marine. That's um, actually met her mom in Japan at the mm. US, at the consulate, the U.S. consulate. Wow. She was a, a uh, I don't know what exactly her job was, but she was a young Japanese gotcha. lady, and and they started dating. And uh, yeah, are you afraid cool. to ask her what she did back then? No, I, I feel like I've been told before, and if, this is where we give you a break. Sorry, man. <laughs> if, if, if if my girlfriend's listening to this, or if Eugenia's listening to this, she'll probably be like angry that I can't remember, but. Uh, yeah, I want to say diplomat, but I don't think it was that high level. I think it was she could have supported, yeah, diplomatic work. Yeah, but yeah, so I see. We're we're headed back out to to Nashville. Um, again, no, sorry, Tennessee. I was just in Nashville for my brother's wedding, and then now we're headed back to Chattanooga. Yes, that's that's a haul. That is definitely a haul. It is it's brutal. Thankfully, we're going to have more help with the driving that's good. this time around. That's it's, good. It's going to be all four of us, but but yeah, so. Let's give it. Well, tell us a little bit about what uh, Virginia State University was like when you went. Well, I was I was like basically a adult learner. So 
I would go um, to, to class on campus, and then they had like off campus classes I would go to, but they had basically the same curriculum that the college had, had itself. So the, the two years that I spent there, um, it was a mixture of on class, on, on campus classes and off campus classes, mm-hmm. um, satellite classes or whatever like that. But um, the atmosphere was great. I mean, as far as, you know, the the sports and everything like that. I didn't play sports at Virginia State. Because your knee got wrecked in high school. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So most most thing you know I was doing was like the academics. Um kept kept a pretty high um GPA um at Virginia State. It was in the upper threes. Um got through that, got my um bachelor's degree and then it was like a break. Went into the guard. Hmm. And then um, Colonel, um, what's that? That had the um, schools tall. I can't ever think of his name. Bolton. Yeah, Bolton. C- Colonel yeah. Bolton. He did that forever. Yeah. Yeah, Colonel Bolton. When I was in the IG's office, came and asked me. He said, "What's?" He said, "Sergeant Holcomb." He said, "What you ever think about getting your uh, master's degree?" And I told him, "No, I never thought about it." So he kept hounding me and hounding me. So, really? And that's how I got to go through Averitt. Um, kept a, a, a GP a 4.0 the whole time. I don't, nice. even, I don't even know how you do that. <laughs> right. I, I don't, I, I don't was, know how anybody gets a 4 What was your area? Why, why were they wanting you to get a master's degree? And what did you study? Um, well, at Virginia State, I was criminal justice. Because that in between all of this... Um, I actually work for the Department of Corrections as well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, I worked for the Department of Corrections for about 17 years. And and this was in between college and me going into the Army. So what I did, um, I worked um, 17 years for the, um, for the Department of Corrections, started at... Um, uh, Power Ten Correctional Center. They have the complex they had there and there. Um, Deep Meadows, they call it, place that I started. And then I left there and went to Nardaway Correctional Center when they built that and opened that up. And then left there and went to the training academy in Waynesboro. You were a correctional officer? I started as a correctional officer and worked my way up to a sergeant. And I left from Nardaway Correctional Center as a sergeant and went to Waynesboro when they had the training academy. Correctional Training Academy in Waynesboro. I went there and worked there for seven years and made the rank of captain there. At the and then after six years, I wanted to get back into the field to as an assistant warden to get into the warden administrative part of it, and could never get out of that. So that's when they got the opportunity to come back into the military, come into the military. Mm. Um, so correctional. Wait, 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 hold, hold on a second. So, so I get the timeline straight. You're in college. You you graduate. You're in your early twenties. Right. You're doing seventeen years correctional. Right. Which puts you into your mid to late thirties. Right. But you you were a traditional M day soldier for a long time. I was. So we'll come back to the, to the guard thing. So okay. I had forgotten you were in corrections. <laughs> right. You have got to have some amazing stories from your time in corrections. So if you don't mind, if you could share one or two of those stories, because I guarantee you, they're, they're uh, they'll, they'll. I'm guessing you'll tell us something unbelievable. I'm telling you know, when they tell you that that's a different world, it is. It's just like when you walk in that place and those doors shut behind you. It's it's a whole different world. So. And what you what you have to realize, and you don't really realize until you get out of it, is that you actually take up a lot of the characteristics of those inmates in there. It's a subtle change in your personality. Um, you stay serious about everything. You know, you never laugh. You never smile. I mean, I mean, and but you don't see it, but the people around you see it. Oh, you know, yeah. you're definitely serious about everything, and um. I, you know, I was told that when I left I, and went to the training academy up in Waynesboro, um, a good buddy of mine, he was a state police officer in Virginia, um, J.J. Bunch. Mm. He said, Carl, he said, lighten up, man. He said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said you got to got to get over. He said, lighten up. Say, you're not in there anymore, right? But stories, a t- um, couple of things. Um, one was 
I was just a green officer, just come off of, um, well, I hadn't really gone to training. And they sent me out on a road gang. Mm. Um, and these inmates, they were cutting this ditch line. And this um, captain came down, um, Captain Fleming came down. He was walk, um, doing his rounds, checking the field gangs. And I remember he came up to me because the supervisors had the white shirts and all. And they back then they had like the gold bars and gold. Mm-hmm. So, and that, I mean, that impressed me. And I said, wow. I mean, he came up, he said, he said, Officer Holcomb, he said, how you doing today? I said, fine, sir. He said, let me tell you something. He said, you're a little too close to these guys with their weapon rights. But I mean, it scared me to death, right? Yeah, bet. So anyway, I got through that. And then one night, the 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 people that were in the um in my unit, I had like a um, C unit. The way it was set up, you had a concrete main building where you had like the control room where you sit in and then they it was just starting out so they had like trailers, twelve man trailers connected to each side, like three twelve men trailers right. connected to this concrete building. And that's where the inmates stayed. And I remember this inmate came in from the slaughterhouse because Powhatan Correctional Center had a slaughterhouse. They actually were self-sustaining. They they did the potatoes. So, so the prisoners were working in the slaughterhouse. Exactly. They, and you you were, it's amazing that process. You would see a live cow come in. They'd shoot it. <laughs> so by, by the way, I, I I'll. Tell, I think we may have talked about this at breakfast, but I, I have to bring this up since we're talking about a slaughterhouse. He's a vegan, right? Daniel's yeah. a vegan. So okay, <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, but don't don't stop. No, I no, mean, I, I don't right. want him to stop. I'm not trying to get him to stop. Yeah, right. keep. No, I just want. I wanted that out there. Right. right. <laughs> but the, the cow would come in. You know, you they they'd slaughter him. You know, and you see yep. a full grown cow, and at the end of that process, when they, from them skinning it to, to gutting it to doing everything else come out in a package like this right here your packages you know that's how that slaughterhouse worked yeah and you had inmates in there that was you know doing the skinning and those knives that they use i mean they super were sharp super mm-hmm. sharp and you can, if you can imagine five to six inmates in there with knives like they're doing this and you're like the only officer that's why you're deathly serious all the time <laughs> exactly and so fast forward to the night that i'm talking about I'm sitting there in the housing unit as a supervisor running this housing unit, C unit. And I don't know what made me pay attention, but I looked up as this guy coming from the slaughterhouse and he had a, a, a manila envelope, like those legal envelopes. And he walked past the control room. And I, like I said, I don't know what made me look at it, but I looked at the envelope and I seen about this much of the tip of one of those knives mm. that cut through the back of the envelope. And when I got up and I called him, he took off and ran all the way back in the back of the unit. So now, me not thinking, I'm just thinking about getting that knife from him. I'm running back there with it to catch him. And next thing I know, I tackle this guy. And me and him is down on the floor, wrestling over this envelope. We got this knife in it. And I'm in the middle of one of those trailers mm. with 12, with 11 other inmates. And then you got 12 inmates in the other, so you got 24 inmates there, plus the 11 inmates. Plus the dude you're wrestling plus with. Plus the dude yeah. I'm wrestling with, right? And I'm down there on the floor with him wrestling, never thinking about, you know, this is crazy, you know. You could have you get killed right here, you, You're outnumbered and there's a knife in play. All the way around. out, You know, so anyway, we down the floor and, and I finally wrestled him down and got the knife from him and everything. And he got up and he was saying, well, he said, well, you see what he did to me? He said, um, I need witnesses because I'm going to file a writ of habeas corpus on him. I'm going to get his job. A jailhouse lawyer. Exactly. <laughs> and all the inmates looked at him and said, I didn't see nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so none of them filed anything, didn't didn't witness for this guy or nothing. Because they liked you? or They, they did. did. Yeah. They did. I was, I was strict with him, but I was fair with him. And I found out if you did that, you didn't have anything to worry about and didn't have to give them anything other than treat them, treat them like human beings yeah. and, and be fair with them. Yeah. And it's amazing how that works. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. 
And either even tell them, say, well, if Holcomb has to lock you up, you deserve to be locked up, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. They, they would come to my defense all the time. That's great. Right. Was that common for them to have an appreciation for, for a correctional officer, or was it mostly like inmates versus the officers? Some officers caught hell in there, believe it or not, because every little thing, they would charge them. Because you had like you had a court system inside the institution, too. They called it um, like a, a committee where they could bring them before an uh, institutional court. Mm. And so you all, they already got charges from the outside that got them there. So now they're inside the institution, they do something, and you write them up, that adds time they put them in lockup or whatever like that. So Nickel and diamond leading to more time is it, not exactly. the way to go if you're a correctional officer. Right, exactly. And, you know, I was a firm believer in this, you know, okay, if you did something serious, yeah, I'm going to write you up. But if it was something that was petty, what I would do, I would use that to my advantage because they hated for you to have anything over them to where they felt like they owed you. And I would never write them up, but I would remind them of it. And so they said, oh, man, you know, it, so they got to appreciate that. And that's why they would say, well, you know, you treated us fair. You treated us like human beings. And they had 24-7, 365 days out of the year to figure out how to beat you, how to beat, beat the system and everything else. And they knew the law, they knew the regulations in that institution better than you did. But um, if you treated them fair, you know, they didn't mind. You know, they would they would support you. It's a good thing you had that approach because that, in that example where you're there with 36 inmates wrestling with one of them. Right. I mean, they, they would have had – one of those guys would have had no problem picking up that knife and exactly. giving it to you. And then the other incident I'll tell you about – um, we had just opened up Nottaway Correctional Center and it, the heat like it was for the last couple of days, 90 some degrees. And these inmates, they had brought people from Brunswick who had a ride. They, Brunswick had a ride and they had brought them and dumped them mm-hmm. on Nottaway because we was a fresh institution to open up. And knowing that that's what happens when you open a new institution. Right. Up, the other institutions that, that have the, the people that they don't want they send them to the new institution, get them off their hand. So all the troublemakers come to the same spot. Pretty much. So I'm sitting there in the breezeway of my building, a building, which was the, the lockup section. That's what I ran, um, isolation section. Mm. And so I'm looking out on the boulevard, and I'm seeing all these inmates congregate with these long trench coats on. I said, 90 degrees, and these guys walking out here with these trench coats. I said, something's getting ready to tick off. And they was getting ready to riot that day mm. at the institution. And I was thinking, I said, these people, they got shanks and everything. I mean, they coats. got all kinds of stuff going oh, on. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so I left the breezeway and went over to the watch office, and I told the watch command, and I said, I don't know. I said, but it's something that's getting ready to happen out here on this yard. I said, I don't like what I'm seeing. And so he said, well, what, what do you think, Sergeant Holcomb? And I said, well, the yard's got to close here in the next 20 minutes or so. I said, so we got to go out here and close the yard. And so I said, well, I'm going out here and close it. And um, my cousin had just come to work there. And I told him, I said, come on and come with me. So the watch commander stopped me. He said, Sergeant Holcomb said, you know, if you go out there, you may not make it back in here. And I said, well, I knew that when I started this job. Right. And so, hear me, my cousin, come out there and I said, look, just stay by my side. Don't say anything. Just walk with me. I said, if they say something to you, you don't answer them. We're just going to walk. So I walked through all these inmates. They brushing up against you, talking to you under the breath and everything else, right? Mm. And I looked down at the at the far end of the um, boulevard, and I saw this inmate named Leroy Mason. And um, he w- he had came f- with me from Deep Metals, and I had known him for ages. And he, I mean, this guy, I mean, he was humongous. He was a power lifter. Yeah. And so I told Leroy, I said, I so told my, my cousin, I said, just come with me. So when I saw Leroy, I said, hey, Leroy, can I talk to you for a minute? And he stopped because he was lifting weights. And he stopped. He said, yeah, Hoka. He said, what can I do, man? And I said, look. I said, 
if you got anybody out here in the yard that you care anything about, I said, I'm going to blow the whistle here in about 10 minutes. I said, I want you to get them and take them inside. I said, because if anybody's left out here after I blow this whistle, I said, they're going to jail. They're going to, you know, get locked up. And so he said, he said, oh, OK, no problem. And there was another guy about half the size of Leroy out there stood up and he cursed at me. Mm. And so I said, who you think you are? And um, Leroy looked at him and said, didn't you hear what Holcomb said? <laughs> the guy hooked those weights down. And Nick thing I know in about 10 minutes time, when I blew that whistle, the whole yard was clear. Oh, man. Nice. Now the, didn't have a single problem. The yard was clear. And so I guess the watch command and the system warden at the time, they couldn't believe it, you know how two people, myself and my cousin, could go out there and clear their yard of 400 Asami inmates that was looking to tear this institution up, mm. didn't have a problem. And what were they going to gain by tearing the institution up? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. So you, your cousin, and Leroy? Pretty much yeah. cleared the yard. I, I like to make friends with the big guys. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's incredible. Right. Were you ever part of a riot? Were you ever in the yes. middle of one? Yes, sir, I was. It's <laughs> funny you should ask that because I was telling you about the training, right? I hadn't even been to training. Power 10 Correctional Center had a riot, and they were like right down the street from where we were, and they threw the 36 inch baton in my hand, threw me on a bus. Mm. Next thing I know, no training at all. I'm standing in the middle of the hallway. At Power 10 Correctional Center, state police got dogs and everything going up in there. No training at all. Doesn't make any sense. No, it no, does. like martial arts training or wrestling or anything. If you didn't know what you're doing, go for what you know. That was about it. <laughs> martial arts training was not something anybody considered back in the day, right? No, yeah, but that was it, you know, because I had no formal training in correction, nothing about that baton or nothing. It was just, you know, uh, if anything go down, you you was gonna go for what you knew, mm-hmm. right? Mm. Yeah, scary. It was. But you ended up, you're still here. You're still with yes, us. Yes, thank the Lord for yeah, that. My goodness. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's talk about the stuff I'm really excited about because I, I know some of these stories. Yeah. Uh, so you were how old when you joined the Army National Guard? I was 22, 23 years old. All right, so you, you became a uh, traditional soldier, yes. M-Day. Nobody knows what that means unless you're what a is guard. What M-Day? Yeah. I don't even does the What does the M stand for? I don't even know. <laughs> We've been saying it so long, I don't even know what it stands for. It's one, right. it's one of those deals. But what it really means is uh, if you're a private, you're doing one week in a month. You're doing 15 days in the summer. Mm-hmm. As you get some rank, you might be doing some more time, might be going to some more school and right. kind of thing. But it, it's basically uh, what what some people would refer to as weekend warriors, which right. always uh, bothered me because yeah. we were doing a lot more than just uh, exactly. weekend mm-hmm. stuff. Um, but anyway, so you were 22, 23, and you were M-Day for quite some time. I was. So when I met you, you were already AGR. Yes, yes. Which and, stands... you, and I thought you were a lot, I'll come back to that, I thought you were a lot younger <laughs> than you actually were. Right, right. I mean, you were a lot older than I thought you were. Mm-hmm. I, I guessed you were in your early 30s, and mm-hmm. you were not in your early 30s. No, sir. Oh, man. AGR stands for Active Guard and Reserve. Right. So it's basically the uh, Title 32 in the U.S. Code. Right. Uh, it's, that means you're full-time at that point? Yeah, he's full time. So uh, after your correctional officer career, I was still I was still um, traditional. They the end day M day soldier. I was still traditional up until eighty six eighty seven, um, and that's when the division changed over to light infantry. One army. Right. 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 And um, what happened was I went through basic training for um, combat service support unit um, that was in Chase City that was attached to um, unit the 183rd in Farmville. All right, we, we're going to have fun here, Daniel. When he says stuff you don't understand, just go ahead and ask him, but we're not going through all the ranks. All right. I, I've got the ranks pretty well down, I think, at this point. <laughs> wait, wait, you said combat service support? Yeah, right. tell us about that. Okay. <laughs> combat service support basically is like beans and bullets. Um, we we weren't really the fighters, but we had fighting capability. Um, actually, when I came in, um, they were they still had the jeeps that you hear us talking about all the time, like on Mash. Exactly. Oh, nice. Right. And um, 
What is it? They had the um... sergeant major is 110 years old. <laughs> <what he's telling. laughs> right. <laughs> the the um, I'm trying to think of the name. They actually had the guns on those jeeps at the time. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. The unit I went in Chase City. I'm trying to think what it, it wasn't dusters because the air defense artillery had, had the dusters. They weren't um, 60s either, though. Were no. They? Well, we had the 60 machine gun. Well, that. That was the infantry um, unit that was in Farmville yep. that we were attached to. They had the 60 machine guns that mounted on the back of the Jeep. They're part of the 183rd. Right, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. And so we were like, they are, they are beans of bullet support. But that unit that I was in, they actually um, recoilless rifles. That's yep, what it was, yep, yep. the recoilless rifles. That's what I started with, and then they phased those out. And um, that unit became a tow unit, mm. an anti-tank unit. Yeah. And so we, I stayed with T- them. T-O-W. Right. Not T-O-E or T-W-O. Okay. Right. Tactically, oh, I used to remember what it stands for. But anyway, right. right. It, it take tanks out. Okay. Right, right. right. So anyway, um, I stayed with them, I guess, about a year, year and a half. And I went through basic training f- with them. When I was there, because that's, that's the unit I left to go to basic training on, and um, I got back and I was I was full of it, right? I I was ready to do some high speed stuff, yeah. And I started dying on the van, van, because I said I said no, nah, I said I can't stay here. And the way luck had it, you know, it's when they did the division changeover, mm-hmm. and um, they were looking for people to volunteer to go through the light leaders course. Yep, they still teach it. Right, right, yeah. right. And so they came down to the unit that day in Exodus and said, who in here would like to go through light leaders course? And I raised my hand. So I left out of there and um, went and went through like an eight-month training thing. Mm-hmm. Um, weekends, eight-month weekends or whatever, you know, getting certified as a light leader. And then the two-week summer um, camp or two weeks AT period in August, the hardest time of the year. And what they did, they divided the Ranger bat up in at Benning, the third bat. They split them in half and sent half of the Ranger battalion up here and left the other half at Benning. And they took people out of Virginia and sent them down to Benning for them to, and the ones that were left here in Virginia, that bunch of Rangers came here to Virginia and they trained us. So for those, oh, so you went through light leader being trained by Rangers. Yes, I and did. From the regiment, we were the first. We were the first course, we first group. Oh wow! To go through this is eighty five, eighty six. Yes, yes, okay. exactly. Okay, exactly. And so, <laughs> you look like you have a question. Dan. Well, okay, so you had you basically had Rangers and some non Rangers, and the Rangers were teaching you light leadership, which is a leadership course for light infantry, small unit tactics, right. light infantry, right. right. Okay. It, it, you basically call it RIP, Ranger Indoctrination Program. That's basically, we was, we was going off the same uh, um, mode of instruction, method of instruction that they actually trained the Ranger School students, Dan at Benning or whatever like that. They yep. took us through basically the same phases and everything, but instead of going through like eight straight weeks or whatever of the school and going through mountain phase. Um, three phases. Three phases. They took us through them, but they were like on weekends, and then it culminated into the two week exercise mm. where you would you were sleep deprived because one time once you finish one mission, they get right back on the horn and give you another one. Mm. So for for those those two weeks or whatever camp, that's what you were doing. Kept going, kept going. And at the end of it, you graduated with the doing a uh, assault on Turtle Turtle Island. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and what Turtle Island was, it's the place at AP Hill called Turtle Island. It was a little island sit right in the middle of a swamp. And all around it was just nothing but war. And this thing, this island sit right in the middle of, of the swamp. And you had leeches and everything else in there. And you had to go across through this, the swamp to do an uh, assault on, um, on Turtle Island. Wow. And it's not for the faint of heart. And you're no. tired. Exactly. Yeah. And like you're supposed to, I'm guessing, not get caught while you're doing it. Or? Well, you had you had a um, ranger instructor right there in your hip pocket, and they would come up to you and they would quiz you 
like they, they pull out the map and say, well, Sergeant Hogan said, where are you at right now? So you had to know where you were. And um, then he'll actually say, well, how you know this is where you're at? And you had to do terrain association. You were telling where right there at Turtle Island, this is where we are. And Turtle Island is right here on the map. So he said, okay, I'll go for that. And then they would have you in different leadership positions from like the platoon leader to the platoon sergeant to squad leader. And they would rotate you They'd through. They would rotate the positions. Right, right. So you had to, they would give you the mission and you had to actually do an operations order, brief that operations order, plan the mission. And then what normally would happen is once you, if you were in a leadership position and you got the mission, they would take you up to you actually doing the operations order, planning the mission or whatever like that. Then they said, you, I'm killing you off. And they'd pick somebody else up and say, okay, you you're, take, the leader now. you're the leader now. And so the whole rotation, I started, they put me in a leadership position and they wouldn't kill me off. <laughs> they wouldn't? <laughs> they would not. They made me the platoon leader and kept me in a position. I had to do a do a uh, assault on a, a um, on an um, objective, and they from the time I planned it, the day the op order, the brief the op order, we get get everything set up and all. They kept me in that position all the way through the end, all the way back to to the um to the area, rear area. You were tired. I was. Why do you think they did that? Well, the the range instructor when he he um stopped at night he would call everybody back to the back of the building and he had their grade school their score cards back there and um he called me he said sergeant holcomb said come back here a minute said i need to talk to you and so he called me back there ranger brown no we'll forget him and he said you're looking for me to kill you off weren't you <laughs> and i laughed i said yes sir and i was he said i know you were he said he said, but no, he said, I, I just want to see how much you could take, how far you could go with it. He said, but you did a hell of a job. Nice. Right. Nice. Right. right. So that made me feel good. And so once once I got through that, um, I was still traditional at the time. And then uh, we were doing a boat mission down on one of the lakes. And um, Captain Nelson, the one I was telling you all about the other day. Yep. He was former Marine. He was Amphia, Recon, Ranger, Scuba. He had so much. This guy has so much. His physiology was you could walk up to him at 4 o'clock in the morning and say, I need you to just keep running till midnight. That was <laughs> 20 nothing. hours later. And he's like, all right. That was nothing for him. You Nothing for him nice. at all. And he was twice our age and could put you in the dirt in the day of the week, you know. But oh, I, I, you know, I remember this. You're right. telling me about this yeah. guy. I love that. He's, yeah. he's the guy that would run just slightly in front of you. You try to pass him, you can't get by him. Can't get by him, no matter how hard he try. Yeah. And he knew it, too, you know, but he would he would say, tell, tell me all the time, I said, don't you get out here and try to kill me, Hoko. And no, no, very well, I couldn't do it, right? Right, right. <laughs> but, but, you know, that's you know that's how he was. But he would motivate you like that, you know what I mean? And the knowledge he had, though, it was it was amazing. You know, the amount of knowledge he had and what really, really made me um, see, you know, how smart and how he was. He w- he would have the Amphib Recon guys come up. We would train with them. He knew p- most of the SEALs. They would come up. They would put us through training with them. And I, I got the 12 years I stayed with the Light Leaders course at AP Hill. I got to do, I had to do more training with different um, parts of the service than I would have ever got if I had stayed in that service combat service support unit. Mm-hmm. And so, so you went through the school, yes, and then you just stayed there as an instructor. Well, this is what happened. Once I graduated the course, I was still traditional at the time. And Colonel Johnson, he was special forces. Um, he made general in Maryland. Yeah, I remember Johnson. Right. Yeah. Yep. He actually. At the end of the course, should have made it in Virginia. Yes, I think, exactly. I think there was a little uh, turmoil about that. Yeah. Right, right. But anyway, he came to me and he said, oh, "Sergeant Hook, he said, I heard you did an outstanding job." He said, "How would you like to come and be one of my instructors here?" And I said, "Yes, sir, I would." And so he told me, he said, "He said, okay." So 
couple of months passed by and I'm still going to Chase City for my drills. And so the um they they turned around and they I went back up to AP Hill for something and he saw me. He said, Well Sergeant Holcomb, I thought you said you wanted to come and be an instructor here for me. And I said, Yes, sir. He said, sir, what's going on? I said, Sir, I don't know. I said, I talked to my command and I told him, you know, that I wanted to come and all. He said, Oh, I see what's happening. Now, mind you, this is on a Sunday afternoon at AP Hill. Wasn't anybody in state headquarters at all. Oh, they they left by uh, 1400, bro. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but I don't know who Colonel now, General Johnson did, but he went in his office. He had made one phone call. And the time it took me to drive from AP Hill to my home in Mechanicsville, which is about a half an hour, they had my orders cut, and I was assigned as an instructor light leaders. That normally takes uh, two or two or three months. <laughs> right. So that's how I got out of my unit in Chase City. Once I left there, I never went back. Mm-hmm. Um, they cut the orders and everything, and I got got assigned to AP Hill as an instructor for light leaders course. All right, and, go ahead. Sorry. Right, and that, that's where I was for the 12 years I was there. That's a long time. So you saw a lot of people come and go. Yes, uh, I did. There as well. What, what are some of the names and, and guys you remember? I, I remember a lot of those guys, but I don't know as many of them as you do. Are you talking instructor wise? Yeah, instructor wise. Yeah, yeah. Um, you had Mike Finnegan. Um, you had Washington. He was an engineer. You mm-hmm. may remember him, black guy. Um, that um, uh, he he was he was engineer. You had Ralph Deer. You had Greer. Mm-hmm. Um. Who else you had? Horton. Um, yep. Myself, Ricky Kaiser. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know you know. You, you know. got to help me get Kaiser on this podcast. Right, right. Um, you, you notice he didn't say, sure, I'll, no problem, because he knows Kaiser on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he. Kaiser, he, Kaiser was the ops sergeant major for our deployment. Right. He was the right. command sergeant major. And, and, right. Mm, but no. he and I, I mean, we were just like this. We met, he was, a, he was an E5 coming off of active duty. And um, I had just made my six traditionally at um, AP Hill. And so he was out on a gun range that night. We was doing weapons qualification because what they would do, they would really run courses. It was like 15 days straight. Um, a bus would come in with a, with a battalion or a bus come in with a group of soldiers, NCOs. And we would start them on day one and we would run them for 15 days straight mm. graduate them by the time we graduate them salute them whatever we had a day or two to refit and another bus would drive in and we would do that so for cycle in and cycle out run them through light leaders course and mm. one of the things we did besides going through the rites of passage or the uh, range indoctrination program the same thing that they that the rangers put us through one of the things they had to do was qualify with weapons, all these weapons on the range. And it would run sometimes at night. We did night fires and everything else. And I had a lieutenant come in. And and when, when you do those leadership schools, and the range school does the same thing, they strip you of your rank. So you can be a lieutenant, you can be a captain, and you can be a private one. But when you step off the bus or step there, you don't have any you're rank. All, you're all the same. You're right? all the same. So that's how we ran it. And this lieutenant, I don't know what happened to him, but Sergeant Kaiser went to him on the range because once you fired a weapon, he had to pick up the brass. And I guess the lieutenant thought that he was too high to pick up brass. So he, I, I want to be clear here. I was not this lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he... um. Gave Sergeant Kaiser a bunch of stuff, and so I heard it. I wish I'd seen that. I wish I'd been there. But but Sergeant Kaiser, he was just he had just came in, so he didn't really know that you know the end. What if you get it, get away, away with, with right? Yeah. So anyway, I heard it. I turned around, and I saw it, and I just stepped over there, and I told Lieutenant, I said, "Sir, I said you don't have any rank here. I said you're just like the rest of these soldiers. You need to get down here and get this brass up, like he told you." So he looks at me like, who are you to tell me? And so, but he went on and did it. So the very next morning I rolled in and then Colonel Johnson was sitting in the Quonset hut that morning 
with his hands on the table like that, with his shirt pulled over his head, sleeping. Yeah. And I cracked the door open, and he looks up like this. He said, he said, oh, that's just you, Hoka. And he went back down like this. So about five minutes, I hadn't gotten in there five minutes, the same lieutenant bust through the door. Going to complain. Going to complain to him Ooh. about me. Ooh. And, I mean, never addressed him. Never reported to him or nothing. He just bust through the door. He didn't and, follow protocol at all. Right. He just bust through the door and started ripping into me and telling Colonel Johnson what I had done to him. You're there in the room? I'm standing there. I'm Actually, I'm sitting now right here at this table. And so General Johnson looks up at me like this. He said, he said, and who are you? <laughs> and so Lieutenant told him, I'm Lieutenant Sir. He said, Okay, Lieutenant, he said, this is what I need you to do. He said, I need you to go back out that door, get yourself together, and you're going to come back in here. You're going to report to me like mm-hmm. you're supposed to. He said, and once you do that, then we'll talk. Lieutenant came back in, stopped, saluted him, told, you know, reported to him. And General Johnson said, well, said okay, so what did, what's the problem? And so he said, well, this sergeant right here, da 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 he told me, he said, stop. He said, let me tell you something, Lieutenant. He said, that's my sergeant. If he told you to do it, you do what he tell you to do. He said, and furthermore, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had no idea what he was walking into. No, and he said, furthermore, get out of here. He said, and if I ever see you again coming to me like this, he said, you'll be on the first thing leaving up out of here. You won't even have to worry about graduating the course. Mm. Right. He's the worst kind of leader. Right. Worst kind of leader. Right. Mm. Yeah. Wait, what? The lieutenant is the, the lieutenant. worst? Oh, okay. Right. No, right. not Johnson. Right. I, I, I vaguely knew Colonel Johnson, right. uh, retired General Johnson. Uh, he I, he had a very good reputation. He did. You seem to be really good at getting people to trust you <laughs> and count on you, you know? Right. And have, have, have them be on your side. Right. It's, a useful, it's a useful skill. Right. Very useful skill. So some of the other names that I knew there were uh, Stockhausen, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sergeant Major Heron. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Virgil Gray was there for a bit. Exactly. Um, In fact, he's the one that got me back to the engineers. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Peck. Was Peck there? Yes, he was. Dwight Peck. Yeah. Yes, exactly. If I thought hard enough, I could probably name some guys. <laughs> but, but you guys did very, very serious training. We did. You enjoyed what you were doing. Right. The camaraderie, my it impression was, was It was, higher through, than you it was through the roof. Um, and we got, basically, we got to to train the division when they trained when they switched over to light leaders um infantry we trained all we was in charge of doing all the, the specialized school scout platoon course sniper course we we actually did did the mois the methods of instruction wrote the training did the repel master school we did the uh, rites of passage. It was, it was a blank slate, and y'all got to make, make up awesome right. training. Right, and it, and exactly. It, was it still a lot of rangers, or was it more? Um, we had very few rangers. We may have had two or three rangers, qualified people in there um, at the time, and it was just us. We had gotten the training, but you had a mixture of active duty people and traditional soldiers coming in, and they teamed us up. We had teams, so... And all of the teams specialized in something. So you had an engineer's team that specialized mm-hmm. in engineer training. You had an infantry team that specialized in operations orders and, and actually tactics part. And, you know, it was it was fantastic. And you did that for like the 12 months then. And then during the winter time when we weren't actually training the course, we got trained because we had a chance to, for ourselves to go out to schools. And get certified as, as in um, air assault, um, pathfinder, all those courses. We got to go and and um, go through it. Mm, but for this course that you taught, you mu- you had pretty much all control over how to do everything and how to teach these. Yeah. Uh, Cause, but we had basically it, we had the the lesson plans and everything from the range of battalion. So that's who we, that's the methods of instruction that we actually followed doing these courses from mm. them. Nice. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I think was your first AGR job in the engineer battalion, or did you get AGR before that? Um, 
No, the first, believe it or not, the first AGR job I got was a readiness NCO job at um, in Franklin for air defense artillery. Oh, wow. Right. So you left ITD, Infantry Training Detachment, and went to, went, to an ADA unit. Right. I, I forgot we had an ADA unit. Right. I try to forget it, too. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you want to forget it? <laughs> he's judicious in what he's going to talk about. He's not going to talk about everything. <laughs> uh, let's just say that that wasn't my cup of tea. The only reason, the only reason I went there was to get my promotion to E seven mm. because it was it was a struggle being an AGR soldier or going on AGR program. It was a struggle to um, to get promoted, um, and so. Coming from the ITD Infantry Training Detachment, I um I had made E seven on the traditional side, and I actually did become AGR while I was there, because I came off a of traditional status to AGR for the um, Infantry Training Detachment, but I had to give up a rocker. Mm, I, yeah, that's right. Because yeah. the only positions they had active guard was E six positions. So I had to give up a rock. I had gotten promoted to Sergeant First Class E7. So I had to go back to E6 to come AGR. Mm. And so AGRs only have a certain number of slots. Um, and it is divided up in ranks. So it, the higher you go on the pyramid as AGR, the slots get smaller and smaller. Right. And you're competing against other AGRs. So... By them, dissolved, they dissolved the infantry chain of detachment finally. And it was a lot of people who really didn't trust us because they said, These guys are wild, they're crazy. I, you know? I loved all you guys, right? I loved you, guys. So, you know. But they didn't realize they had a diamond in the rough because we were the ones who basically Good training, new everybody. training, every because that's all you did in peace time, exactly, exactly. So we knew training. You know, we didn't know anything else. We knew training. Mm-hmm. And so you had a few commanders then that actually stood, stood up and said, well, I'm going to take a chance on these guys. And once they got us out in the field as what they call readiness NCOs, E7 jobs, they thought to said, wow, what were we missing all mm-hmm. along? And that's how, you know, we got our toe in it into, into the system. And we went from there. Yeah, I, I had uh, Stockhausen as my radius NCO when I was a company commander. And right. Best thing that ever happened to me. Right, right. Don't, don't tell Stockhausen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's not listening. Um, no, he, he'll listen to this one. Right. Oh, he'll cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you were ADA, and then you came to the engineer. Because I want to get to the part where you and I met. Right, and that's – I had been with the engineers about a year and a half. And the way the system was set up, you had they had it so that you had to stay – in your unit at least two years before you would be eligible to transfer out and go anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So I had been there about a year and a half, maybe a year and seven months, and I was thinking to myself, I said, I got to get out of here because this is not my cup of tea. In and, Franklin, not, not Friday. And this right. isn't traditional anymore. It's not weekends. No, this you're, is, you're there full time. Yes. I he, mean, he's getting the unit ready to go to war. Right. That's this what, is, that's what this the is me. So anyway... When I first got to Franklin in that ADA unit, I mean, they had um, IG complaints and everything, I mean, out of the butt. I mean, people were, fa- the, the, um, IG and all stayed at Franklin. And when I got there, basically I turned the unit around. It was, you know, it was it was amazing to see the trans- transformation in that unit. And um, Captain Pendleton, who was my commander at the time, and Sergeant Major Johnson was my first sergeant mm. at the time. Cheyenne was my first sergeant. Mm-hmm. And he'll tell you today, he said, he said, I don't know what I'd have did without it. He said, I don't know what this guy, he said, because when he came in to apply for this job, he said, I was thinking to myself, ain't no in the world this guy's going to do anything to help me. And they were always prepared when they came in, the captain and, and, Sar- and um, first sergeant Johnson. They were always prepared because I would brief them during the week on what was going on, the day-to-day stuff, and then I would have everything laid out for them when they got there. Well, you were the commander of the first sergeant during the week. Right, right. So anyway, then that's how I ran it. And he had basically just sit back. The unit ran itself after that, and he loved it. 
So anyway, I stayed there for a year, it's about seven months, I think. And then I saw that um, Sergeant Didley, Mass Sergeant Didley, mm-hmm. yep. that he was Alpha Units Red in the NCO. Oh, I was the XO when Didley was Red in the NCO. And I'm not I think it was um, whoever was the operations sergeant at the time. I don't know if it was Sergeant Major Webb or who. who it, may been, it may have been Sergeant Major Heron or something. Whoever was it the, op- the operations sergeant had made Sergeant Major. So that opened up that. Um, AGR slot is the op sergeant for Dead Lake. For Dead Lake, right? So he moved out of Alpha Unit to that, and that left that Redness NCO job. Up. So I saw it come over that thing, and so I put my application in, and um, I got on the phone and I called Colonel Gray, and I and I said, "Hey, Vir- sir. Virgil, right?" I called him, and I said, "Hey, sir," I said, uh, "I see you got um a op uh." Look, the Redness NCO job opened it out. He said, yeah, he said, he said, you interested in it? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, I'll tell you what, he said, I've got several other people that's interested in it, too. I got Pecker, he called him Pecker. He, right? <laughs> he said, um, um, <laughs> his name was Peck. Peck. They called him Pecker. <laughs> right. He said, I got him. I got Dalton. He said, and now I hear you, you interested in it. He said, he said, well, I can't lose. He said, either one of you guys he said, he said, I'll be, be on the money. So I said, yes, sir. He said, well, get your packet in. He said, and, and we'll see how it falls out. So I'm, I'm at home. I drove back from Franklin that, that, that Sunday. And I'm at home, and the phone rings. And it was Colonel Gray. He said, what are you doing, Sergeant Hoka? I said, sir, I'm just getting in the house good. He said, get your uniform on and come up here to Fredericksburg. So I said, okay, sir. So I rolls into Fredericksburg, and I can't think of who else was on the board, but they interviewed me that mm. Sunday afternoon. And um, then I, that's how I got the job. I got the job. And I stayed there as a Redness NCO, did that for, I guess, about two, two three years. That was, that was a fun I – lo- I love that battalion. I was there for 12 years. When you right. got there, you were Alpha Company. I'm pretty sure Sergeant Lilly was Bravo Company. Was it Lilly? Yes, it was. I think, I think Tim, it was Tim Lilly. Well, right, but he no, it wasn't Tim. Tim had left. It was oh, um, Tim left. Tim, Tim was gone. It was Bones, um, Bonner. Bonner, Ed Bonner. Bonner, right? I mean, Bonner was in Charlie Company. He was my first radio in Charlie right, Company. Right. And Stockhouse was in Charlie Company, and Don Willis was in headquarters. It, headquarters, right? I mean, what a team! I'm telling you, we. I mean, we team. made it happen. I mean, it was great. I loved all you guys. Yeah, but we got along great. I mean, the, the camaraderie and, you know, helping each other out and everything. So when one person was weak in something, you had Don there, you know. He had come in, you know, and, and I mean, we basically trained each other. Y'all just wanted of, everything to work. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I guess sometimes we were on worst center because we didn't have the equipment a lot of times. But we would find things to substitute, and we made it work. I mm-hmm. mean, the training and all was fantastic, and um, so I did that, and and then I turned around and I goes to lunch one day, and I come back in and I see a a message over my computer saying from the state sergeant major, who was then Dallas Mills, mm-hmm. said, um, Sergeant Holcomb, give me a call when you get back. And I'm thinking to myself, do I really want to make this call or not? And I'm sitting there saying, because if a state sergeant major is getting ready to call you for something, or you want you to call. It's probably bad. It's going to be bad. So I sit there, I know, for at least 10, maybe 15 minutes debating on whether I want to call him or not. So I finally got up enough courage, and I made the call. And um, he said, how you doing, Sergeant Holcomb? And I said, fine, Sergeant Major, what can I do for you? He said, look. He said, um, I got a position coming open here in the state headquarters for the IG's job. He said, um, Master Sergeant Glasscock is getting ready to move back out to the battalion. He said, and we're trying to figure out who we could get to come in and take his place. He said, and your name came across the desk. And um, I'm just calling to see if you'd be interested in it. And I, my exact words to him was this. I said, well, is there a promotion in this? Sergeant Major, I said, because if it's not, I'm satisfied right here what I'm doing, where I'm at. We were happy campers there. Oh, yeah. Okay. And he said, he said, no, he said, you come in, 
you go to the school, you pass the school, he said, and once once you do that, he said, you'll get promoted. So I said, okay. And so I went there, and it didn't work that way, though. I went there, and I went through the school, passed the school of flying colors, came back, was in a job a year, two years, and I kept on the promotion system because they had it where you had to come to the top of the list of your MOS. And once you came to the top of the list of your MOS, then you could go ahead and get promoted. Well, I had done that several times. I'd come to the top of the list, and um, they would always bring somebody in and put them on top of me. It was not a uh, scientific process. If I no, it, no, it wasn't. So anyway, I got really disheartened about it because the job only let, was supposed to last for three years, but I wanted to wind up extending me in that <laughs> job. It's internal affairs for the Army, essentially. Pretty You're much. You're not the most popular person in the world. No. And um, I had dealings with prior IGs um, because they would come in and do do inspections on your unit and stuff. And they basically they called them the black hats. They'd come in and they would hammer you for any little thing. You know, I mean, they would write the unit up and everything and fail them on inspections and stuff for stupid stuff. And um, my my thought was this. If I'm not here to help you, I'm not here to harm you. And so that was my whole thing. I would call the commanders and I would tell them just like this. I would say, sir, this is what, what was brought to my attention. This is what I found. Now, this is my suggestion. You can follow it if you don't. I said, but if I were you, I would take this step, A, B, and C. And I said, but it's up to you. And that's how I would leave it. I would never tell them, you're going to do it. You're going to mm-hmm. do this or whatever like that. And so they really appreciated that part that I didn't just throw the whip out there, you know. Because you could. You I could. could have. But I did not. You know, my job, I thought, was to try to help you correct stuff more so than try to, you know, say, point the finger and say, I got you. Yeah. And um, after the four years, um, I got came back to the battalion. Yeah. And once I got back to the battalion, I got the position as a first sergeant in Alpha Company. Mm-hmm. And then they had me doing the op sergeant's job, too. Yep, yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so I was doing first sergeant, doing the week time day or whatever like that, slash operations. And on the 